Today we're going to do a round trip between Avid Media Composer and DaVinci Resolve. We're going to create proxy media in DaVinci Resolve and we're going to send it over to Avid Media Composer for the editor to work with. When the editor's done, they're going to send the timeline back to DaVinci Resolve where the color pass is going to be done. And when DaVinci Resolve is done with that color pass, it's going to send that back to Avid Media Composer for distribution. Now all along the way, both programs' timelines are going to sync up back and forth perfectly, but they're each going to work with different media. Resolve with the camera raw, and Avid with the low-res proxies and the final color corrected imagery. Let's take a look and see how this works. So we're in Resolve. This is a brand new installation, 16.24. Uh, I've brought in a whole whack of clips, as you can see. This is footage shot on Blackmagic camera of Danielle painting a mural on the side of a shed. It's all come in flat log. Some is raw, Blackmagic raw. Some is Apple ProRes. I've got 1920 by 1080, Ultra HD, 3840 by 2160. Everything is 2398, although some was recorded at 60p, so it's going to play back in slow motion. Other is just recorded at the live speed, regular 2398, so it will look normal. We have a little bit of everything to play with as far as footage goes. The workflow we're going to do is going to be very basic. We're going to take all the clips, we're going to create a new timeline from those clips. Uh, we will call it Daniel Batch. I did this ahead of time just to speed up the process a little bit. And here is the string out of everything that was shot. There's no particular in or out marked. It's literally everything that was on the card. And that's about an hour and a half worth of footage, hour 20 minutes worth of footage. Okay, the next thing we're going to do, just to make it a little easier on the editor's eyes, um, we're going to just put a very quick and dirty color pass on this. All I did was add a LUT, add the black magic LUT, and then I dropped the whites down a little bit because of all the shadows and highlights. Get a, got a little overexposed. So we just uh, put this on a timeline track so that it affects every clip on the on the uh, timeline. One setting, just enough to make it look a little bit better, but try not to make us uh, spend a couple hours coloring shot every single shot just for low res proxies. Now, of course, I have to throw out a thank you to the camera guy. Uh, that was me. So no complaining about my shooting style. Once that's set up, we're gonna go to the delivery tab and we are going to export all these as individual clips. Now I chose MXF OP Atom. This is essentially what Avid would create natively. It will create a separate video and audio track for every audio channel. This particular media can get placed inside the Avid Media Files MXF folder structure. Avid then builds a database from it and you then can work with it within Avid as though you was originally created within Avid. I'll do uh, DNxHR and I'm going to drop the quality down to LB. It's just lower as proxy. I don't need to have huge 4K files for an offline edit. Let's go look down on the advanced settings page. I always make sure I'm set to either video or full. I don't leave it on auto. I don't need a time code burn and we're going to make sure flat pass is turned off because we've added our quick and dirty little color correction to help the editor out here. We will export the audio. There's nothing uh, particular on the audio. Maybe some music that Danielle was listening to, but uh, we'll leave it turned on. We need to be individual clips, not a single clip. A single clip would do the entire timeline as one big file. We want every one of these to be spit out as an individual clip with its original file name. So individual clips will do that. And under the file tab, again, source name will ensure we get the original 
footage as it was shot with the actual file name as it was shot. We're just converting it to a more friendly codec for Avid. Uh, I'm going to leave unique file names turned off right now because that's not necessarily at this stage, but we will come back to that later. Everything else looks good, so we're going to send this to a folder. We're going to make a custom folder inside our Avid Media Files MXF folder structure that Avid is used to working with. And we're going to name the folder Danielle Painting Lores for now. And before we hit the render button in Resolve, let's make sure that Assist Using Real Names from the Source Clip file name is turned on and Use Time Code embedded in the Source Clip is turned on. If these are not turned on, our proxies will not work properly in this workflow. And we are going to export that media. Once it is done, we will come back. Okay, so that has finished outputting. It took about 15 to 20 minutes. We're done in Resolve now, so let's just uh, save the project and uh, quit Resolve and we're going to jump over to Avid. Now inside Avid I have created a 1920 by 1080 project. I have opened a bin. I have named that bin Danielle Painting Low Res. So now how do we get that media from Resolve into Avid. Now all that media was put into the folder Avid Media Files MXF Danielle Painting Low Res. Now this is OP Atom so you get one video and a separate audio track for every audio track that was on the source file we were working with. So again this is typically how Avid would make media so the idea is we now want to get Avid to read this as media that had it had originally made. The problem we have, Avid doesn't know what's inside this folder because there's no Avid database in this folder. So in order to get Avid to create the database, we have to name this folder something that Avid can associate with and then do its scan and its index and create a database for. For most of you, that'll just be a number. Number one, number two, number three. Uh, you probably already have a number one folder in this uh, area. So maybe you want to name this number two or number three or 22 or you know seven, six, blah, blah, doesn't matter. As long as it's just numbers, no letters, Avid will be able to scan the directory and create a database inside it for everything that's uh, within that folder. My system is a little different, as you can see. That's not going to work for me. I'm on a shared storage setup. So for me, uh, my naming convention is a little different for my media folders. So unless you're on a shared storage system, you will just use a number. For me, I use the name of my box, and then a period, and then a number. Then I can click on, click on Avid, and now it is indexing that folder creating the database. I like to keep my folders clean, so once that database is done, I'm going to rename it back to Danielle Painting Low Res. Uh, that'll help me with cleanup later. I don't need to exit Avid to rename that folder. Avid's not going to crash. Avid now knows what is in this folder, and down at the bottom here we can see it has created a database in that folder. I just have to get the information from this database into this bin. So we can either import it old-fashioned, file import, work our way to the folder that has the database we want to read, MXF, Daniel Painting Low Res, right down the bottom, select that and tell it to open up that database. That will bring all those clips into this bin. And there they are. Everything's here, everything plays. But there's a more, uh, another quicker way of doing it. Not maybe quicker, but a little easier, I think, because the Finder window or the, the Explorer window is open. We can actually just drag the database into that bin. Uh, so a little less clicking. All the media is there. And uh, we can actually see here we have 
the source file name is intact. I'm just going to call up a media tool setting here so we can see that the tape name is intact. That's very important when we do the relink uh, process back in Resolve. So we should be good to go. Our next step is then simply to go cut a timeline so that we have something we can send back to Resolve. So I'm going to take a break here. I'll do an edit and we'll come right back. Okay, I've got about a minute and a half timeline here of Danielle doing her painting. Before we send this back to Resolve, let's just look at a couple of items here. We brought in some music. We did a little edit on it. I've got one shot right here that's in reverse. Instead of, instead of going from the ground over to the sky, we're coming from the sky down to the ground. So let's just keep that in the back of our mind. Let's see, Let, to make things a little more interesting, let's take a shot. Um, how about, find one here. How about the last shot? Let's take this shot and let's uh, do something to it. Let's uh, call up a resize or a, a 3D warp effect. And let's um, blow this shot up. Um, say this much. Uh, yeah, how much is that? That's, uh, let's just change that to a nice even number. Let's make that uh, 40%. Or I guess in Avid, we have to make that 140%. Okay. And uh, we might as well put a little, we could put a little animation on it, make it a little more interesting. So we'll put a keyframe there, and we'll move this keyframe. And we'll just try to uh, offset that tilt down a little bit. We'll fight the camera tilt as much as we can here. Okay, what else can we do here? Let's see, uh, maybe this shot here, we'll put a little um, color correction on it. Let's say the editor looked at this shot, thought it was usable, but was afraid the client was going to complain about it. So the editor brightened it up a little bit. Uh, it's just enough so that we can do an effect on it. Just so that there's something on the timeline is all we're looking for at this point. Just uh, again, to help with this workflow show you how this workflow works and um, maybe how about this shot here let's add an effect and let's add a non-avid effect let's add a sapphire filter effect and let's just do a simple blur I'm going to use Sapphire because I do not have Sapphire in Resolve. I do have Boris in both uh, Resolve and Avid. Sapphire is only in Avid. So I want an effect, again, for the purpose of what I'm trying to show you, I want an effect that is not in Resolve. So we put a little blur on this shot and we could we can uh, tidy it up a little bit, maybe have it do a little rack in. So we'll do a keyframe and bring it down to... Uh, Bring it down to zero. Make it look like uh, the fantastic cameraman was racking as he was moving here. Good enough. That gives us a timeline, minute and a half timeline, with a plugin, a motion effect, a color corrector effect, and uh, a resize or a native avid effect pretty standard fare for what an editor might give you back as a colorist or what you as a colorist might use so now we're going to send this back to resolve for color so first thing we want to do you always want to send out a reference movie with a time code burn on that movie my time code generator that i would send to color and if I'm in color and I've got an editor sending me something, I always request source name and source time code. I've put the uh, record time up in the top right corner there, 
but I really am more concerned with the source name and the source time coat. If the colorist has trouble with a shot not matching up, this is the best way for them to see what it should be. They can then look at their timeline to see what they have. And uh, hopefully through this information, they can track down the replacement shot. Uh, I'm also, once this is all said and done, goes into Resolve, we'll use the audio off this reference movie in Resolve. In case I have like 20 tracks of audio, I don't want to have to deal with that either. So just export this as an H264. Nothing particularly special about it. And uh, now we have to make a list. Can't take it into Resolve without a list. So we're going to make an AAF. I have a preset for it, and it's a very basic preset. There's nothing um, terribly um, hard about it. We're going to use marks and selected tracks, so it is dependent on what's selected here and with my ins and outs. Uh, we're going to do both audio and video. I don't need the audio, but there are some circumstances with lists and file types and frame rates where it might insist that I have audio turned on. So we'll turn it on, leave it, and not worry about it. And both audio and video are just going to link to the audio and the video. And we'll save that as a list. When we make that list, uh, let me just bring this bin over so you can see what we got here. It automatically creates a exported copy of the timeline. So it duplicates the timeline, puts the name exported at the end of it. By loading up this timeline, I can actually see exactly what the list has or exactly what the colorist should get in their list. Um, other than that, this timeline can be deleted very quickly. But this is a great way to double check that what we see here is what the colorist is going to see. If we're missing a video track here that we think should be in here, then we know our settings are not correct. But once we're happy with what we've got, we could actually just delete this exported timeline. It's not going to do us any more good. So let's export or let's uh, dump out of Avid. And we're going to head back to Resolve. Okay, so we're about halfway there. And I was looking at my watch and I was saying, wow, this is really long. I didn't think that it would take that lo this long to explain this. What I think I might do is I might end it right here. And we're going to do a part two where we do the second half of all this. So we're going to send it back to Resolve and then back to Avid. So come back, take a look at part two. Thanks for watching.